I'm just going to say right from the jump, for its price, released at the tail end of 2021, this is a good phone, a, a great phone even, and it's one that I've decided to keep, but of course no phone is without its quirks, no phone's perfect, but I'll leave you with this. I think this is probably the best phone for most people. So let's talk about why people love Pixel phones. So to begin with, Pixel phones don't come with bloat like other Android phones do. This is straight from the source. It's Google's phone as the intended, and this is slightly different as Google have created their own Tensor chip to go with their software, so their hardware and software is vertically integrated. In fact, if you're in the Apple space and you're thinking about going over to Android, this is probably the most iOS-like phone you could get. In fact, I say it is the most iOS-like phone. Pretty much the gestures are very similar. So if you want to come out of an app, you just swipe up to go to the home screen. If you want to back out of the app, you could just swipe in from the left side. On Android, you can also do it from the right side, which makes backing out of the menu a bit more accessible. I'll touch on a major reason why people love Pixel phones, and it's probably the strongest factor. For still photos, the Pixel 6 is probably one of the strongest shooters in the smartphone category. I had the opportunity to test a camera out on my travels in Ghana this year, so you'll see some of that footage in this video. From the first generation Pixel, these phones have been known for their impressive stills, and for those who know about smartphone photography, it has at times held the crown for the best still shooter in its category. The key word being still. For video, other phones had the Pixel beat, but when talking about photos, few phones could touch it in terms of bringing detail, contrast, and range into shots that look fantastic. In recent years though, the competition has really caught up and the Pixel line stopped emerging as a clear winner in the stills category. So unless you were a Pixel fan, it became harder and harder to justify its purchase. Now, taking a look at these shots in good daylight with no edits or filters, this is just straight out of the camera. The general Pixel trend here is aesthetically pleasing pretty much due to like colors. Now, I tend to prefer how Samsung does its color processing. They tend to deliver on punchy and vibrant colors, but I know a lot of people who prefer shots that are more natural and less saturated. And for many, Google's pretty much working towards what they feel is perfection when it comes to their HDR processing. So when you press the shutter, what's actually happening is your phone takes a series of shots and then image processing works in the background to achieve balance in photos, so your highlights aren't overexposed and you can still get details in the shadows of your image. Moving into less than perfect daylight, that's why I find the phone can throw a bit of a wobble. So nowadays with smartphones, you can feel confident that you can simply point, shoot, and then pop your phone back in your pocket. But when light falls, the Pixel 6 can give some mixed results. In falling or dimmer light, the phone works in this weird space in which it chooses not to activate night mode, which is often the right choice. But what tends to happen here is that it will crank up the ISO, so it will crank up the sensitivity of the digital film. And what you're left with is a flat and noisy shot. And it's kind of puzzling to me because my Pixel 2 that I previously owned would never do this. That being said, this happens 1% of the time, if that. And in this specific condition, I'm only really mentioning it as it's just so shocking when it does occur. At night when light's really low, the camera app automatically places night sight on. If you find this to be a nuisance, this setting can be toggled off and the phones will start performing in these conditions anyway. I have to say, early critics of Google's implementation of Night Sight were kind of saying that it made night images appear as though they were shot in the day. I don't think this is ever the case, and it's really not the case here. The images, whilst not exactly true to life, still maintain perspective as well as detail. That's why for me, Night Sight on the Pixel is really up there with the best. Much has been made of the fact that there's a new larger image sensor in this device, and my feeling is that it plays a large role in just how color accurate and clean images are when taken at night. On the whole, for still shots, it says a lot that this mid-tier device can hold its own and often exceed the capabilities of phones costing twice as much. Now, I think this is a great shooter, but the litmus test is how other people respond to photos produced, and by far and large, they really like the images. But for the sake of argument, let's bring another pair of eyes to critique these photos. So, hey guys, um, I just want to take you through a few of the photos that we took whilst we were on holiday. And I know that you guys have experience with a range of phones, but your daily drivers are Samsung. So I want you to just appraise these photos, what you like, what you don't like, and any differences between the Samsungs that you currently use and the Pixel right now. So here's the first photo. Uh, can you just walk me through the things that you like about it? Cool. So yeah, like I, I use a Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus. I've been using it for like three years now. And whilst I like the, the photos that are on it. One critique of Samsung phones is that sometimes it can be overly saturated and too punchy. And sometimes that can cause imbalance in certain lighting situations. I think this photo does really well to balance the, the, the light and the dark. You have the roof, which is over this bar, this like, um, sorry, beach bar that we're at, I guess, that's creating the patterns on our shirts. And it's really handling those dark and lights really well whilst keeping our facial complexion, like our, the overall complexion, in fact, 
is very accurate in this photo, I'd say. And I think it just really does a good job. Even the focus in this picture, you know, it keeps both of you in focus. You can still see immense detail, whether at the, at the background of the photo and in the forefront. So I think it's a really, really balanced photo, to be honest, and I, I really like it. Kwame, I'm, I might ask you about the next photo, actually, this one. So I think this one is zoomed in. So it's actually a really good photo. Um, again, it's handled the colours very well. My yellow shirt versus Josh's yellow shirt. Two very distinct shades, if you like, of the same colour. The bag in the middle is there, but you also, the person's knee has two strips of light going across it. And I actually think that this photo actually captured that quite accurately. Mm. It may look like it's quite highly exposed, but this is actually quite accurate what was going on on the day because there was a super amount of sunshine and if we move towards the background i do like how it's also caught the background um there's a bit of bokeh sort of in the very very back which i'm not 100 percent sure about but everything before that the two ladies in the back is very very nice i really like that and i think overall again it's, it's a very good shot um yeah i'll add to that i think my critique of this shot is it's i feel like it's slightly washed I feel like there's a there's some kind of glaze on it that's slightly washed compared to the other photo. And yeah, that's like my only critique of it. But as you said, it's slightly zoomed in. So as you know, what usually happens with phone zooms nowadays is that it can't retain the color accuracy um, once you mm. crop in on, on a photo. So yeah, I, I wouldn't be too surprised if that's why it's got a different color accuracy to the first picture. No, it was so interesting that you both said that. I, I really dislike this photo. Um, I think it's, you know, like pixels try to go like heavy on the, the HDR processing. And I think it's gotten slightly confused. And then the other thing is the bokeh that Kwame spoke about. I think I must have been in portrait mode whilst trying to shoot this. And the phone's gotten a bit confused as in, with regards to depth yeah. sensing. So yeah, but yeah, um, I think it's a decent photo overall. It's just for me, probably the worst out of the bunch, but we're coming on to another. Yeah. I'll probably start with Kwame. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, another photo I quite like. Um, I'm not so sure about the top of the hair. It may be actually, that's, that is that is completely accurate, but I might need to zoom in a little bit yeah it looks a bit strange from um from the zoomed out perspective but it, it really is just that light at that particular portion was sort of coming in from the roof um, overall this is a photo i really like if you look at the sky in the background it's actually captured this very well without either darkening the foreground too much because mm. it wants to capture the light from the outside and doesn't know how to handle the exposure mm. or trying to capture the, the sort of highlights from inside and then overexposing the background. If you're comparing the two photos and if this is a portrait photo, um, and maybe you'll tell us after, for fairness, but like if you're comparing this to the previous photo, you can tell in the previous one, the two subjects, me and me and Kwame, um, in that photo, you can still see that the people behind us were in focus. Mm -hmm. um, and if that is a portrait, obviously it's difficult because you're handling two subjects. And as I said, you, you're most likely going to lose some sharpness and color. Whereas in this one, the edge detection seems pretty good. Even when you zoom in on, on my hair or around um, my top or my phone, it's done well to keep me in focus and give bokeh to the background and blur it out. So I think, yeah, it's pretty, pretty well balanced. That's interesting that you said that because I think what we're observing is not portrait mode. So this is the camera's okay. natural sh like shooting mode. And the bokeh that you're describing is just like the natural rollout in terms of the depth of field. So uh, really I think it's quite that. pleasing, especially because I was sat next to you whilst I took this photo. And exactly. it looks quite natural, which I quite like. All right, so maybe moving towards a more challenging situation. This is nighttime. How do you feel like you're captured here? It's interesting because... um. I feel like the nighttime photography, it's trying to strike the balance between making the darkness look realistic or mm -hmm. just overly, like sometimes I feel like with pixels photos or nighttime photography, it can make nighttime look like day, which mm -hmm. isn't accurate. It makes for a pleasing shot and making everything else look more presentable. Um, I think I look pretty realistic here in terms of colors and everything it's managed to keep the clouds in, but I think also it has a bit of a wash glaze over everything. 
even though it is very impressive what it's doing to capture this much detail in light like in terms of sharpness and color i think it has done really well to be honest even despite that i i totally agree and again this was shot with night mode so there's a lot going on you can see like there's a bright lamp behind there's light coming in from from a yeah. number of sources your phone as well we can see the reflection up on your face and i think yeah. in spite of the challenging conditions it's done quite well actually but yeah i agree on the night effect I think sometimes the phone struggles with night mode or in low light conditions sometimes if I'm going to be very honest. So yeah, I'm hoping for some software improvements there. And then the last shot is here under some warm lights. As you can see, there's a lot of red in your face. Do you, I don't know, you wouldn't yeah. be able to tell like what was going on that shot, but Kwame, like, was that representative of what the scene looked like for you on that day? I actually think yes. So I actually think again, this, this is actually a good shot here. Um, the only thing I may say is that there, there's a lot of reflection on that table, so it may be a bit of a struggle. But again, mm. that could be quite accurate for the angle that you were sitting at versus the light, which are just above Joshua. Um, and the, there are two of them, and they're, they're quite high lit, um, bright white lights, and that's very possible actually. But mm. um, overall, I'd say this is a this is a good nice shot. I think it's quite balanced. There was some other lighting actually going on to the left of us, which were different colors, I do believe. Yeah, and warmer. So this is, yeah, and so this is why, you know, we may be seeing this effect on Joshua, this light, but I do remember that actually being quite accurate. It's not, it's not sort of gone overboard here, even though there's, again, three subjects here, a half a person on the floor, on the, on the <laughs> very left, Joshua <laughs> and myself here. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, t I totally agree with that, actually. And if I'm going to be honest, I think, again, the phone handled this scene well. Can I ask you, though, like, I think Wash mentioned at the beginning of this section that Google made quite a big fuss about real tone and the fact that it was being more inclusive in how it treated photos and darker skin. Did you ever feel like there was an issue in mobile photography with capturing darker skin? Do you feel like it represented you well? And since seeing some of these photos, do you feel like Google have made an improvement in that regard? Yeah, um, there definitely is a stigma behind that. Obviously, um, smartphone photography, I don't think is based on a wide enough array of skin complexions. And so when it comes to processing of those photos, it's going to perform better in certain conditions, let's say, based on how it was programmed beforehand. Um, and I think, for example, my phone, the S10 Plus, you could take the same photo like 30 minutes apart and you'll get two completely different photos wow <laughs> two completely wildly different complexions um i feel like over the photos i've seen from the pixel 6 my complexion relative stays the same relatively across photos obviously dependent on lighting and what's going on around um but i say it's probably the most consistent i've seen so far but i need to see like a lot more photos to mm. to say it's actually doing but i think it's a good it's a great first step for for, you know photography and considering skin tones in and in, in the representation i think that could be a whole nother video thanks so much guys i couldn't have said it better myself i guess i'll involve <laughs> you the next video we do on this subject isn't it but thanks so much and yeah i think i will head over to review the video section of the phone thanks so much guys catch you in a bit cool see you in a bit bye in short, the video quality in the Pixel 6 is much improved, so whether you record at 1080p resolution or up to 4K, and by the way, all footage here is in 1080p, shots are generally pleasant in the Pixel way, so colours are maintained and not oversaturated, and stabilisation does a half-decent job at ensuring that your jerky movements don't spoil the footage. And this is true of both the front-facing selfie camera, of which you only get one, and both of the rear-facing cameras too. There is no telephoto camera on this handset, the Pixel 6, that's the regular Pixel 6. And whilst it would have been a nice addition, I find that I have so few use cases to zoom in when I'm recording. So really, the lack of a telephoto option doesn't make the Pixel 6 feel like I'm compromising in any way. If I had to go between an ultra-wide camera or a telephoto lens, I'd go for the ultra-wide any day of the week. Unlike the still shots that this phone's capable of, 1080p video footage comes out a little bit soft, but it's still workable, it's still decent. The one thing I can praise this camera of doing is really working hard to tone down the overexposed highlights and bring detail in the darker shadow areas, again much like the still shooting camera. This works great in the daytime, but in less than perfect lighting there's a fair bit of noise in the footage. On the whole, it's perfectly capable of shooting decent video footage, but it's still noticeably shy of how this year's iPhones perform, especially in terms of video clarity and stabilisation. 
Also, every now and then, the Pixel 6 will find a few seconds to find its focal point when the camera app is fired up. This isn't so much of an issue most of the time, but if you're somebody who likes to capture footage on the fly, you might find it irritating if you've missed the opportunity to record a candid moment, so that's something to bear in mind. Now, as I said in my first impressions video, I'll leave a link at the top for anyone who wants to view it. This phone is swift. It has rarely ever slowed down, and it feels like no matter what you're doing, apps relatively remain in memory. I tend to get refreshes once I've opened like my sixth, seventh, or eighth app, and that's after Instagram, Twitter, Chrome, and whatnot. So really and truly, the Pixel 6 keeps up with most tasks and hasn't gotten bogged down by bloat over time. Battery life is consistent. I'm probably getting like a day's worth of battery and it's really been solid. It's a fluid UI. Android 12 has been functioning so well. It feels like you're bouncing around the interface and it's really beautiful. So just to go in a bit more depth about how the UI feels. Some years back, there used to be a big divergence in how iOS apps and their Android counterparts would look and feel. On iOS, apps felt standardized and there was a consistency to them. So no matter where you looked in an iOS app, you would have buttons and gestures acting in consistent ways. Whereas on Android, the app experience could be a bit subpar. For example, when you tapped on an app before, it would open up only to load its elements in front of you. Whereas now, the icon flies into the center of the screen whilst it loads up in the background. It seems guidelines around app development for Android have become more defined in a way that makes using Android 12 very pleasing. And if I'm going to be honest, I like the way Android apps are. They've got character and a bit of individuality, but overall, I find that the apps just pop and bounce around and it feels like an elastic interface. It's really hard to explain, but if you can get your hands on a Pixel 6 or if you have one already, just take your time just to bounce between apps, swipe up through the home screen, open some apps. You realize there's a lot of fluidity and inertia to it and it feels fantastic. So one of the downsides of the Android lines of phones is that whilst they've been great for photography and decent for videography, once you upload that content onto social media, and I'm particularly talking about video here, what you get is a noisy compressed screen recording of what was originally great footage. And to anyone watching your content on snaps like TikTok, Instagram or Snapchat, it was clear that you were using an Android. And that's what's even more disappointing as many people choose phones like the Pixel to have an experience as close to iOS as possible. Unfortunately, the deep integration between apps and hardware that Apple benefited from hasn't truly been possible on Android, well, until now. The visual core of the Pixel 2 didn't really perform as Google claimed, but the Pixel 6 is getting a lot closer, and I haven't received any complaints about my footage looking like it was shot on a potato. At the top of the video, I mentioned reasons why people love Pixel phones, but there's a huge feature they took away, and I feel a bit frustrated by this. So up until this year, a major perk of using the Pixel phone was the free unlimited backup of HD photos or videos to Google Photos. And I'm not really talking about 4K footage like they used to, but even without that, it was still a massive perk and a decider for me when it came to choice of phone. So this was fantastic as it meant I could just shoot and shoot with this phone and no matter what, I wouldn't have to worry about exhausting my cloud storage. Now, I don't know where I was over the past year when I missed this news, but starting June 1st, 2021, all high quality images or videos that you upload will be counted towards your 15 gigabytes of Google Drive storage limit. And I must have been so close to my limit on my Google account for years because without much use, I'm now getting warnings on my Gmail account saying that I'm near that limit and reaching that limit would mean I miss out on things like emails and photo backups and I can't afford to do so. My issue is I don't know why more people aren't speaking about this. So if you've come over to the Google space thinking that, yeah, I've got unlimited storage on Google Photos and I can use the Pixel and shoot as you like, it's not quite the same as it was before. There's a 15 gigabyte cap, so please bear this in mind. And if you reach that limit, you'd have to manage your photos like you would with any other phone. Now, apparently photos or videos backed up in high quality before June 1st will not count against that storage space, but it's still annoying to have to manage my media. Okay, so another downside is that when I first started to use this phone and started to use that fingerprint scan in the screen, it was slow to the point where I started to miss the old fingerprint sensors that would be on the back of the old pixels or even the face scanner that you'd have on iPhones. I think the face scanner for me is probably my preferential standard when it comes to security for your phone. It's just so easy. Lift up the phone, look at it and you're in. I don't mind the fingerprint sensor in some ways I prefer it, especially in these days where we're wearing face masks and whatnot. But the fingerprint sensor on the Pixel 6 was very slow to begin with. When I say very slow, it would be like something like a second to a second and a half, but you know, compared to what we had before. That seems like an eternity. However, after an update, things are much improved and I feel like I barely notice it now. I would still love the next line of pixels to have something like Face ID. Please Google if you can. Even if you pull it on the pro tier, I would appreciate that. But for now, this fingerprint sensor will do. And as time's gone on, it's become less of a bugbear. 
Okay, so like I said in the beginning of this video, I really like this phone. I've decided to keep it. I mean, I've been using it for two months and I don't see anything else in the market that I'd like to replace it with. Now, if budget was not a factor, I think I'd go for something like the iPhone 13 Pro Max or the Samsung Galaxy Fold. But if you ask me what phone I'd use as an alternative to the Pixel 6, so in this price category of £600 or $600, I don't think there is an alternative. Its camera is still one of the best out there, especially for stills. The video is much to improve and the battery life is good enough to last you the whole day and a bit more. And with Material U and a 90Hz refresh rate, the phone just never feels like it will slow down. And that's why for me, despite some of the quirks that it came with, this Pixel 6 right here, not the Pixel 6 Pro, the Pixel 6 is the best phone for most people. Thanks for stopping by. Really hope you liked this video. If you did, leave a like. You can also choose to subscribe if you want to keep up with the content. And also leave a comment just to let me know how your experience has been of the Pixel 6, whether it's been good, whether it's been bad, and what phone you choose as an alternative. In the meantime, have a good one, have a happy new year, and I'll see you in the next video.